Okay, so Pete and I are going to do a double act today, talking about um, some um, rock art research that we do both in the central um, part of Western Australia, in the Western Desert, and then Pete will be talking about the Kimberley. Um, as with Sven, we'd like to acknowledge um, that we're on uh, Noongar Woodruck land, but we'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and ancestors of, of the Madu uh, that we work with in the Western Desert and with the um, the Kimberley um, Wororan people that Pete's also been working with. Okay, first of all, I'm going to talk about rock art um, and the recursive nature of rock art. And given the theme of today's uh, uh, session, I'm going to be talking about an object that probably would never actually make it into an exhibition like this. I'm going to talk about a crayon drawing that was done by an Aboriginal man in 1964 um, and was collected by uh, Bob Tonkinson. It was, in fact, um, inspired by Bob Tonkinson's requests to, to talk for a, to an Aboriginal man about his totemic geography in a remote location uh, in the Western Desert. The reason that I'm talking about this is that this crayon drawing is extraordinarily significant to us as rock art researchers trying to understand the rock art of the Western Desert. These crayon drawings, um, which don't look like they're particularly spectacular, actually are, to me, beautiful and incredibly informative. They show not only an incredible knowledge about a, a geographic location that was being mapped remotely, so when, when Bob Tonkinson was talking to Nungabidi about this, this information that he was wanting to collect, they were located 100 kilometres from the place that this drawing was, in fact, being done. The interesting thing about this early anthropology that was being done around Australia, and anthropology is a relatively recent um, uh, manifestation of trying to understand Aboriginal culture in Australia. This example here is actually a map that was done even a bit earlier, 1936, um, by Norman Tyndale. It shows, as he calls it very um, sort of romantically, the wanderings of the Wadigajara. It's basically showing the journey of two creation beings, the two men, the Wadigajara, as they wandered around through Nanajara territory. And when Norman Tyndale collected this map, it also was being uh, collected remotely because Norman Tyndale was talking to these two Aboriginal men. He was getting this information from, from a camp on the Nullarbor Plain. These maps show incredible knowledge of the landscape. They show incredible um, mapping onto totemic geography and the way that we can understand the way that Aboriginal people have known this, their landscapes and, and, and aspects of that is how we're in fact beginning to understand how rock art in fact has functioned in these types of places. So I'm focusing in on a, on a particular range uh, in the Western Desert. We know it as the Derby Hills. It's been on the maps, on the Canning Stock Group maps for a very long time as the Derby Hills, but the Māori know it as Jilaguru. Uh, it's a range just to the lo south of Lake Disappointment. Now, this is the map that, in fact, that Nungabidi uh, drew, drew for uh, Bob Tonkinson, and as you can see, it's been annotated. So Nungabidi, having driven, written, drawn the map and, and given the story to, to Bob Tonkinson, Bob then wrote down aspects of that drawing, again, back in Jigalong. He then published the map um, in his 1978 uh, book about the Madu, and when we were reading this book, when we were beginning to record the rock art, on, rock art of the Canning Stock Route, I realised that this map in fact showed all the locations that we were in fact going and finding rock art. Nungabidi went back to, this, to Jilaguru in the 1980s with Peter Veth. Um, Bob Tonkinson in fact didn't get to Jilaguru until he came out in 2000, I think. So again, we're going back and getting information about this place that was remotely recorded, Nungabidi having been born in this area and coming out in, in the 1950s with, with some drovers. When we, when we did a project on the Canning Stock Group, Bob Tonkinson again came out with the Madu and, and we managed to collect information about this crayon drawing and, and, and the other types of mythological connections that we got from around that, that part of the country. And here's a redrawing of, um, uh, of the drawing which is published by Bob Tonkinson. Now, when you actually overlap, what am I pointing this at? There we go. If you actually look at the difference between that drawing by Tonkinson and an aerial photo of, of, the, of the Jilaguru ranges with the map up locations, you can actually see the geographic connection uh, between that earlier map and our more recent recordings. 
And this, I think, is, it really gives you a sense of not only that incredible knowledge about landscape, but also the iterative nature of rock art, in fact, recording the details of the dreaming. In the story that was recorded by these men on the crayon drawing, we actually see the different uh, acts that the ancestral beings uh, undertook when they entered the Jilaguru Ranges. And we also um, have geographic features, which in fact are taken to be signs of that, of that fact. On the left up here is a, is a range. This is where the men, two men are said to have climbed a sand dune and unfurled their long beards. As you look at this image, you can sort of see an Aboriginal face at the top and this very long beard coming down. This geographical landscape is, is incredibly important in terms of people actually understanding and seeing what people have done when they've got to this, this part of the desert. And then when you look out across the sand plains, you can see where, where the snake went and where it lay its eggs. And these, these, uh, these small um, mounds of rock out on the clay, clay pans are seen as being, again, the natural, or the natural um, aspects of that story and the actual recordings of those, of those um, actions. The other extraordinary thing about this crayon drawing is the fact that it includes um, figurative images. This is very unusual in early crayon drawings. Most Aboriginal people, when they're asked to do a drawing of their, of their jukwa or of their dreaming, drew the sorts of images that you see today on contemporary paintings. This, however, has actually got an actual figurative image of two men. It's actually literally showing us the two men and it's showing us three snakes. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, if you actually read Tonkinson's um, description about the story of the two men's actions when they get to the gorge, the two men went to sleep one night, they woke up in the morning, the sun was being blocked by a huge rock, so they split the rock with, their, with, their, um, uh, with the weapons they had with them. They then went off and they cut, they cut down some, um, cut some trees and actually made some clubs, and they went off to hunt. When they came back in the afternoon, they found that those three clubs had turned into snakes. Well, when you get to this particular place in the, in the, in the gorge, which is recorded by Tonkinson as, as the place where they, this action took place, you find, oop, boy, the rock that's been split, and you also find three <laughs> large engravings of very large snakes. The snake here on the left is more than three metres long. Now, interestingly, when I first was taken to this place in 2000, I looked on the flat rock, which you can see with the arrow, and there are only two rocks there. And I was thinking, oh, so this must be one of those times when two doesn't mean three or three, you know, they're, they're not being very accurate with their numbers. Anyhow, 10 years later, I went back with another Aboriginal person. I said, so weren't there supposed to be three snakes? He said, oh yeah, there's the other one. And there was a rock that had split off and the third rock was in fact, the third snake was in fact on a rock below. So incredibly literal interpretation of the dreaming on the crayon drawing, and in, the, and in the rock art. And the significant thing about this, in terms of Tonkinson's early understandings of rock art and, and the Madu's engagement with that, is the Madu believed that engraved art, as opposed to pigment art, was created by the ancestors. It's always been there. It's been in, left in the landscape by the ancestors so that the Madu could come along later and, and, and feel reassured by, by the, those things being in the landscape. Interestingly, we get similar imagery of the three snakes and split rocks in various other places on that journey, which is, which is recorded in that crayon drawing. Dibel Springs, which is about 40 kilometres away, a large split rock, three, three engraved snakes. Birley Rock Hole, similarly, three snakes engraved on a rock near a rock hole. And we find pigment rock art at these nodes also of these two men as they've travelled through the landscape. Birli Binbi again. So in this very brief um, discussion with you today about an object which has great significance to me, not particular great beauty probably to anybody else, um, I've described how this object uh, creates an intersection between crayon drawings and totemic geography and how that allows us as rock art researchers to actually begin to understand uh, how rock art actually plays a, a recursive role in understanding the dreaming. Aboriginal people have used art in a variety of contexts and they continue to use it um, in a way which allows them to understand and to, and to remember and to, and to explain and to pass on ritual memory. And so from our point of view, that's an extremely uh, useful piece of um, uh, objectivity. Um, and you know, this is the sort of object that I think 
could have been number 101 in this exhibition. <laughs> Thank you. That's <laughs> So I'm going to talk about Wanjana. Art of the Wanjana is described by Ian Crawford. Wanjana are at the most simple level cloud spirits, rock art from the Lilai or the Dreaming and the Kimberley. Extraordinarily, it's one of the oldest continuous living traditions practiced in the world. 4,000 years, possibly six, based on some recent dates just released last year. In a sense, the chronology is not totally relevant in the linear sense, but it is a very deep and ancient practice. Rock art, and specifically Wanjana, has a unique ability to tell us and provide windows into Aboriginal people's origin narratives, which are woven in clearly, strongly with their own origin narratives. It provides insights into cosmology, which very few other material objects, lithics and so forth, can do. And it obviously provides insights into societies in very unique ways, and I'll try and share some of those today briefly. Wanjana is the most recent art style, as I mentioned, 4,000 years. Incredibly, there are at least six or seven or eight earlier phases and styles, depending how you wish to define them. And here, just to give you a sense of that, I've got a map showing earlier uh, dynamic Guion, previously called Bradshaw figures in the Kimberley, which have this northern plateau distribution, um, a wider um, static polychrome or multicolour tradition of human forms that continue right through here to the Northern Territory. And then really importantly, the Wanjana, the living tradition, um, the curated tradition, the repainted tradition, covers this large area here, which you can see in that dotted line. And it's no coincidence that that particular tradition correlates with the Wawaran language family. In other words, it's a, a language family and constellation of some 50 languages which more or less demarcates the practice of Wanjana Wungur. The other distributions belong to an earlier time, different climatic and sea level stands, and in fact, our current or future project on Kimberley Visions will look at some of this shared repertoire across the Kimberley to the Northern Territory. And we believe much of the northern extent of Guion, in fact, is now underwater and was part of that original landmass across the Bonaparte Shelf right through to East Timor, only 150 kilometres short. Another way of looking at that long chronology, or let's call it an intermediate one, not to be too controversial on the dates that we have, um, shows Wanjana here, the living tradition, and a whole range of other really extraordinary figurative and obviously non-figurative forms back to what we consider to be early markings on rocks, the kind of cupules that Sven mentioned before. And there are hard dates on these coming out now as recently as late as last year, between, between about 20 to 100,000 years ago. The other thing to remember in the figurative traditions, the, the Wanjana compression technology, if you like, is that there are many other forms, including the depictions of plants. So we have the world's oldest, we believe, depictions of plants with lilies, yams, staple foods from certainly Guion and pre-Guion times, which probably dates from the terminal Pleistocene. And here are some examples here. That's quite an extraordinary record that is just partly uh, an act of serendipity, but obviously a reflection of highly complex in inscriptions and imbued behaviours from early Aboriginal colonisation. And certainly it's worth remembering that people mark and create art from the very first time that they map onto country as first peoples, and in Australia that it's at least 50,000 years ago, earlier than Eurasia. So how did Europeans see this art? Well, uh, George Grey, who became governor in New Zealand and had various other roles in the 1830s, um, saw and depicted Wanjana. And here are some images of those hand stencils of the four Wanjana figures you can see in the right in a cave, and of the halo headdress figure. And in fact, this iconography, these publications became globally known so that people around the world, particularly in the West, um, actually had to question what it was that so-called uh, primitive peoples could do in terms of their emblatic figurative uh, traditions. It was an anomaly. Um, Gray was a reasonable moderate. Um, as opposed to the more um, flamboyant explorer, um, narrator Joseph Bradshaw, who saw the, or recorded the first uh, Guions, uh, as Agnes Schultz called the Bradshaws in the 1890s. And here are some watercolour depictions, which are now at UWA, 
uh, photograph by Sven Usman. And here they show um, from the original sketches the interpretation of these unbelievable figures in what was effectively filtered as classic Phoenician or Egyptian. In other words, Bradshaw and many others, and still people today, can't believe that these very complex figurative forms showing accoutrements, we weapons and so forth could indeed be as associated with the Aboriginal cultures seen at contact, understood through ethno-history or continuing into the present. And so the racist notions of a pre-Aboriginal phenomena or culture group in Australia grew partly from these kinds of um, depictions. Primitive peoples were not able to make this art. That was the false argument. But as we know from ethnography and actually working with Aboriginal people, these belief systems are very complex, as is obviously their art. And these um, taxonomies of the Wanjana and their sacred and spiritual understandings came from solid anthropological work, starting with people like Elkin and others, where they look at things like the Wanjana having lightning, headbands, hair, but cosmological elements actually built into their bodies. So they're not just depictions of these um, monsoonal, uh, rain-bearing, regenerative species. They actually represent people, ancestral beings, natural order, uh, regenerative processes, cosmologies, and so forth. Highly complex. And this complexity was also uh, borne out by the act of repainting. So as people like Reverend Love and others started to record acts like the repainting of uh, Namurali, right through to the time of Donny Wool and Gudja repainting that for the Olympics, it was understood that these paintings were living entities, that they were corporally related to the people who were custodians, the groups who actually regenerated them. So we know from archaeology and we know from oral testimony that people repainted and overpainted these particular images, and there's one example here, up to 32 times, and probably a lot more. And here's a picture of Donnie Wool and Gudja repainting that particular image, which was seen uh, in the Sydney Olympics. So an image of Aboriginal identity is seen by a billion people. Uh, Donnie and his uh, clansmen still paint uh, those paintings today in the West Kimberley. And if you have a chance to go up to that part of the Aurora and country, you'll see that practice continuing. Then we had some fairly eccentric linguists like uh, McCaffrey in the 60s come and um, actually get people to create portable art, invited them to do it on things like wooden dishes, and Kim Ackerman and others have recorded this. And the taxonomy of the Wanjana was pushed further. So we actually have snakeskin, uh, Kalaru or Ungud, the creative rainbow serpent built into the Wanjana figure. We have yams depicted in the Wanjana figures. We have lightning. We have a whole range of corporal human features such as bone, skin, and blood shown in the Wanjana. So you're starting to get a sense of just how complex these depictions are. And then indeed, if we look at some of the more detailed anthropology ethnography, which we do as archeologists, we get records from Helmut Petri talking about uh, the black cockatoo red uh, feathers in the headdresses of the Wanjana figures. And as you can see with the songman on the right, actually in their bodies, uh, the cockatoo speaking, the blood dropping to the ground, the blood turning into red ochre, that red ochre then being mobilised and painted on people's bodies, and, and therefore the entire thing becomes this very, very complex story of ochres and paintings off the rocks, onto bodies, into the ground, and the creation sagas that make the entire environment. Here's a picture of Modem, the same one that the Frobenius expedition and Elkin recorded before with Sven. Um, here, here we can see on the head figure uh, where it's slightly faded and flaked, um, at least 10 or 20 episodes of repainting. And these very major figures are well known to people. They're on the marriage tracks. They become part of the regional ethnography and origin narratives. Mythological significance of Wanjana, they originate from the sky or the sea. They provide marriage partners. They provide templates for your correct behavior. But you can have an iterative relationship. People dream travel. They actually speak to Wanjana. They're given instructions in terms of how they could conduct various activities. Wanjana provides you with correct marriage partners. Um, people, mythological beings of regeneration are linked in this very simple yet highly, highly complex image. They're central to identity. They're in the Indigenous Protected Area range of program badges on vehicles, on shirts, just as sun iconography and rock art is in the South African coat of arms. They are actually central to people's identity. 
And of course, Wangina um, incorporate contact. And so here we have these wonderful images from the Kimberley from Biggie Island on the top right and the bottom left showing introduced canoes and the Wanjana have actually got 19th century rollicks and oars and they're smoking pipes and on the left they've got snake, they're smoking and they're also carrying pearl shell. So the point is that Wanjana have the ability to accept uh, change. People curate country, they fire country to protect art. Here we're coming in by a helicopter to look at a particular uh, rock shelter site. And intriguingly and importantly, we actually have people like Leah Umbergai as a Wiroran descendant, possibly of some of the original TOs that the Frobenius expedition worked with at those same sites as an artist depicting and recording that very same art, which is being schematized and turned back. There she is at the actual Grey site. We went back and relocated that with assistance and it's being recorded by Leah as a Wiroran woman at the very type site 177 years later. So in a sense, I think this provides a beautiful full circle of bringing the Wanjana, which in a sense was appropriated and contested and used as, as a representational hot potato or football globally, back to the Kimberley through visitation by traditional owners, through respectful curation, through um, Moenjum and other art centres in the Kimberley, and obviously being recorded and curated by those very same Aboriginal descendants and of course in collaboration with European researchers. Thank you very much.